we get started, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Clark Packard. I'm resident fellow and a trade policy counsel at the R Street Institute. Welcome to our discussion today entitled The China Shock in Context, Understanding Normalized Trade with China. I'll introduce our panelists, make some brief remarks to set the stage, then we can get started. I envision this being sort of an informal, free-flowing conversation, and I'll leave some time at the end for some questions. Uh, first up is Scott Lincecum, who is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a visiting lecturer at Duke Law School. He is the reigning neoliberal shill of 2020, a purveyor of mediocre lists on Twitter and a designer of popular t-shirts. Uh, Dr. Mary Lovely is an economics professor at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and a senior fellow at the Peterson in Institute for International Economics and a foremost expert on U.S.-China economic relationship. Uh, there are two of the most interesting people writing on the U.S.-China economic relationship today, so I'm delighted that they could join us and I look forward to the conversation. At the outset, let me state that China engages in troubling human rights and foreign policy practices that ought to be confronted but today's discussion will focus almost exclusively on the U.S.-China economic relationship. To set the stage, in the 1970s, China was one of the poorest countries in the world. It had a population of about a billion people, yet it engaged in little international trade and commerce. 1978, Chinese Premier Deng Xiaoping began to open the Chinese economy, moving away from rigid central planning toward markets. As Dartmouth economist Doug Irwin has noted in his masterful history of U.S. trade policy clashing over commerce, quote, these policy reforms led to a dramatic acceleration in China's economic growth, sparked a rapid expansion in its foreign trade. China's share of world exports rose from minuscule proportions in 1980 to 5% in 2000, reaching 12% in 2014. In 1980, President Carter opened trade with China by allowing its goods to be given most favored nation status Instead of being subject to much higher non-MFN duties, MFN to non-trade wonks would, should just be understood to mean non-discrimination against Chinese products with, say, higher tariffs than on British products. Mm -hmm. The Trade Act of 1974 gave the president the authority mm -hmm. to grant communist countries MFN status on an annual basis, provided Congress did not vote to disapprove. Every year, presidents of both parties would continue granting China MFN status. In 1985, China applied to join the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the predecessor to today's World Trade Organization. In 1995, the GATT was converted to the WTO. The same year, China applied, reapplied to join the WTO. Washington, Beijing, and other countries began negotiating the terms under which China could join the WTO. Through a series of intense negotiations, the United States agreed to grant China permanent MFN status in exchange for China agreeing to abide by WTO rules a set of WTO plus rules specific to China, and over that course cut tariffs from an average of 25% to 9%. In October 2000, President Bill Clinton signed bipartisan legislation granting China permanent normal trade relations, which paved the way for China's entry into the World Trade Organization in 2001. 2016, economist David Autour, David Dorn, Gordon Hansen wrote an inf and Gordon Hansen, excuse me, wrote an influential paper entitled The China Shock, Learning from Labor Market Adjustment to Large Changes in Trade, that purported to show that labor markets were exceedingly slow to adjust to a flood of imports from China that allegedly displaced up to 2.4 million American jobs. Against this backdrop comes Scott Lincecum's new ex excellent new trade paper entitled Testing the China Shock, Was Normalized Trade Relations with China a Mistake, that surveys the landscape surrounding this issue. 20 years later, and China's entry into the WTO still plays a prominent role in contemporary policy discussion. Indeed, the China shock has now become gospel among politicians and pundits who argue in Scott Lincecum's words that, quote, Washington elites have systematically and perhaps nefariously harmed members of America's working class, dooming them to lives of drug abuse, isolation, and despair without uh, creating fertile ground for populists like President Trump. Yet that charge is false. The reality is much more complicated and the charge from politicians and opportunistic pundits ignores the internal reforms that China made themselves. The relevant question isn't whether normalizing trade with China makes sense today, but whether the policymakers at the time made the right choice then. This is not a, uh, an excuse to actions taken by Chinese leaders since PNTR or its admission to the WTO. To be clear, there are significant problems with China's economic model, which we will discuss. Uh, 
At the same time, American policymakers have failed to meet the challenges posed by China's admission to the WTO and subsequent actions. With that being said, let me turn this over to Scott, who will give us a high-level overview of his paper. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Clark, and, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to um, give you a, a, a brief summary of my paper. Um, let, me, let me start by getting the old PowerPoint up here. There we go. Okay, that should do it. Okay, so um, as noted, um, I'm going to give you a brief summary of, of my paper on, on the China shock, which I'm hoping answers a lot of questions that the narrative that, that uh, Clark just described, that we hear all of the time in the press, in the popular punditry, by our political leaders, why it really only scratches the surface and it in fact uh, leaves so many unanswered questions. Um, and I'm going to try to try to answer these a bit. Um, so um, here's, you know, let's start with the unanswered questions about the China shock literature itself. Um, first, we don't hear very often about what else resulted from Chinese import competition. And fortunately, we have dozens of other academic studies issued since the original China shock literature that gives us an idea. So let's start um, with, with consumer gains. So studies have shown that there have been immense consumer gains for American individuals. Uh, one study calculated it to be about $250 per person per year for the rest of our lives. That's, that's a, a significant uh, in benefit. Uh, but but it goes beyond simply cheap T-shirts. Um, there have been corporate gains uh, for a lot of manufacturers, for companies in transportation and logistics and construction and the rest. Um, in fact, uh, much of what we import from China are industrial inputs that other American manufacturers have used to um, become and produce a globally competitive products. There also are, of course, export gains, not only for American soybean farmers, but for, again, American manufacturers, American service providers. And there have been studies that have shown that these have not only been good for multinational corporations, but have also been good for American jobs and con contributed substantially to the American workforce. Um, other studies applying uh, a general equilibrium model, essentially looking at, at the economy as a whole, not merely at the discrete um, uh, job dislocations that the China shock paper looked at, found economy-wide welfare gains, meaning, in other words, a better standard of living for the country. And this was, in, in, even in the regions, found to have been harmed by the China shock. You hear this a lot, that this was a regional problem. Well, actually, um, these same papers looked at this over a 10-year period, and they found that actually, uh, even these regions ended up um, being better off in terms of net welfare. Finally, and importantly, because the China shock is a job story mainly, um, we also have seen that series of papers talking about that actually a lot of companies, including American manufacturers, actually produced new and different jobs. Um, this not only was in manufacturing, but also importantly in services. Manufacturing providers, for example, uh, shifting from the provision of uh, the producing jobs to services jobs. So the next question is, and I think the most important question, is what would have happened in the absence of the China shock? And this counterfactual really is never examined. Well, first, we see that there are a lot of non-trade factors that have contributed over the years to U.S. manufacturing job losses. Um, this includes, of course, technology and automation, but it's also things just simply like changes in, product, in, in processes and um, in other types of technology. As you can see from the, the graph shown here, um, there really is not a significant change in the decline in manufacturing's share of all U.S. employment basically starting in the late 1940s and going through China's entry to, to the World Trade Organization and PNTR. Also importantly is the fact that uh, studies show that a lot of the industries that were 
hurt most by the China shock have actually been in long-term decline, that these industries had moved from the Northeast and in uh, high human capital areas to the South and lower human capital areas. And they were really on their way moving out of the country already. And they would have done that regardless of the China shock. So well, that's odd. So we have uh, another question here is what would have happened, or the, the role of non-China imports? And I apologize, my, my PowerPoint has gotten a little weird there. But anyway, um, so, and this is also critically important because what we see are that uh, Chinese imports primarily replaced non-China imports. As the graph here, as the chart here shows, you know, really this, the share of uh, Pacific Rim imports into the United States has been remarkably constant from 1990 to 2017. The big difference, as you can see in the gray bar there, is that the, the share changed uh, for China dramatically from only 3.6% to, you can see, 26.4%. And this is really important because it again asks, well, what would have happened without Chinese imports? And the most likely answer is that these imports would have simply come from other sources. And then finally, it's really important to note that, that it wasn't, the United States government did not simply embrace unfettered trade during the China shock period before and after. The fact is that we have uh, hundreds of special duties on imports, particularly from China, um, and all sorts of policies that have tried to subsidize jobs, have tried to uh, handle adjustment for workers affected by imports. And these, these policies have simply failed to prevent the type of dislocations caused by imports, and they failed to help or, or keep these industries in place. Time and time again, uh, these, these protectionist policies uh, have, have actually failed. So finally, I think it's important to also note that there have been a lot of experts that have really questioned the, the top-line conclusions of the China shock, this 2.4 million jobs number you hear a lot. First, some critics ask, well, you know, that is, is that, that's a gross job number. What about net job losses in terms of the whole U.S. economy? As I uh, noted in, earlier, in the earlier slides, um, when you include as a net, those job losses essentially disappear. Um, and the economy overall, of course, has gained millions of jobs um, since the China shock ended in 2011. Other studies have said, well, you know, the trade flows examined were only gross trade flows. In other words, treating a, a, a $500 iPhone as a $500 import, instead of looking at the value add. And in that case, you know, China only derives a few bucks of that value. And when you look at value added trade flows, again, the, the jobs lost from the China shock shrink by almost half. Other studies have said, well, the China shock period ended in 2011. If you extend that period out a few more years, then factoring in the Great Recession, you actually see, again, most of these job losses disappear as manufacturing jobs increase substantially since the Great Recession. Uh, also importantly are the contemporaneous accounts of actual trade flows and jobs. And I think the most important thing to note here is that, you know, several experts in the Clinton administration, in the, in the George W. Bush administration, and since have, have said they were staring at the data during the time and it just didn't show what Otto Dorn and Tansen found in their China shock literature. And I think the most important example of that, and again, getting back to what we talked about with non-China imports, is we have actual experience um, with trying to block Chinese imports as President Obama tried to do in 2009 with Chinese tires. And the result was not some dramatic revival of the US tire industry. Instead, it was simply a shifting of imports to other sources like Brazil or Thailand. So again, really um, a calling into question whether the China shock was, or these Chinese imports were really driving these broader seismic trends in trade and manufacturing jobs. And then finally, um, it's just important to put these numbers in perspective. You know, 2 million jobs destroyed over a 12-year period, while certain nothing to laugh about, um, is, 
you know, uh, no, it's far less than the weekly job dislocations we've seen during COVID. But even leaving the pandemic aside, you see that the 1 million manufacturing jobs attributed to China were less than 20% of all manufacturing job losses during the China shock period, um, and, only, and less than 5% of total job losses during that period. So, you know, when, when policymakers talk about totally upending a U.S. trade policy, economic policy, labor policy, foreign policy, it's really important to have that, that perspective. So next, you know, I want to answer some unanswered questions about the PNTR, the WTO, and China's rise. So first, we need to ask whether PNTR really opened up the United States to China and really caused the China shock. Well, as Clark mentioned, um, when you look at the history of normal trade relations in China's WTO accession, we see that the China shock wasn't really that shocking at all. Um, the United States had granted normal trade relations annually every year for two decades. Um, studies estimate that by the time that the final uh, permanent normal trade relations vote was, was being cast, that the chances of a uh, of Congress rejecting normal trade relations was down below 2%. Um, so really, there wasn't much of a shock here. And in fact, Chinese imports into the United States had been increasing substantially long before PNTR had been granted. Moreover, as Clark mentioned, um, China's accession took 15 years and was the result of dozens of bilateral and multilateral meetings that I catalog in my paper. Furthermore, um, as there is the question of really what else other than uh, PNTR fueled China's export competitiveness. And there again, there's a, a thick economic literature showing, as even quoted in the China shock papers themselves, that it was other factors, particularly China's own domestic uh, economic liberalization and its uh, removing import barriers. As I can sh show you in the tables shown here, um, China's tariff rates dropped dramatically as I was preparing to enter the WTO. And that actually helped fuel China's export competitiveness. It wasn't simply about American policymakers flipping a switch and suddenly China became a, an export powerhouse. Um, so, and that gets to the next question. Would denying PNTR really have stopped China's rise? And that is, of course, the implicit assumption you hear in the China shock narrative, the anti-PNTR narrative. As already noted, the reality is that China's economic reforms themselves are far more responsible for China's export competitiveness. And these were market-based reforms, things we would hopefully be celebrating, um, than any sort of single vote by the United States Congress. That was really what was dr driving China's economic power. Second is that it's really important to understand that there was not a, a realistic uh, opportunity to deny China's entry into the WTO. Um, as already noted, China was reforming substantially in the mid-1990s. Um, <clears throat> but beyond that, this was a country with over a billion people with nuclear weapons and joining an open multilateral trade organization, one that already included uh, command and control economies, uh, included Cuba, included countries with other human rights violations. Um, denying the w uh, China entry of the WTO or somehow unilateral isolating it was simply not um, a really realistic option. And in fact, when you look at the costs and benefits for the United States, this wasn't really about, uh, as you hear sometimes, grand dreams of China becoming another Japan and, and uh, democratizing and becoming this wonderful liberal place. The fact is that if you looked at the actual costs and benefits of denying PNTR, it turns out that PNTR was really the only realistic option for American policymakers. Otherwise, U.S. companies and farmers would have lost out in the Chinese market. They would not have, have blocked China's WTO entry, and there would have been other uh, foreign policy issues, such as North Korea, um, that, that would have um, also become Come a problem if the United States had somehow tried to cut off trade with China. Also importantly is to note that Chinese imports still would have continued to enter the United States either through the annual normal trade relations process or through the miracle of global supply chains where Chinese inputs can actually enter the United States as goods from other countries, um, but of course um, aren't picked up in the customs data. Um, 
And then finally, it's really critical to note that, uh, as Clark mentioned, China has had backsliding since WTO accession, but that's not a really a failure of PNTR or China's WTO accession. It's really a failure of U.S. Uh, policymakers and other countries to really confront China on these issues. If you look at the, the data and you look at the history, China actually does respond quite well to, for example, WTO dispute settlement. But the United States hasn't brought many cases, and the cases that we have brought they really haven't followed through in terms of compliance proceedings. There's also a ton of other issues and other mistakes. For example, the United States um, rejection of the Trans-Pacific Partnership or uh, uncompetitive corporate tax and regulatory policies or labor policies. All of these deserve criticism, but uh, by, and by focusing on PNTR, um, we, we avoid that criticism. So, that really gets to the last point. Why does this all matter? You know, PNTR and the China shock um, ended years ago. Um, PNTR was 20 years ago. The China shock ended a decade ago. There's not going to be a repeat performance. There will be no Vietnam shock, no India shock, or whatever. But as as noted, this still remains high on the list of priorities for American policymakers in terms of um, pointing to the mistakes of past U.S.-China relations. And because China may be this generation's biggest geopolitical issue, and given all of the serious human rights, foreign policy, global health, and economic abuses by China, the Chinese Communist Party, um, we really need to think about and formulate a proper response and a proper way to criticize not PNTR, not American policymakers from 20 years ago, but Beijing, putting the blame where it really belongs. And, it's also critically important to think about the real and seismic economic disruptions that have upended American families and communities over the last 20 years. By focusing on a singular issue, a singular vote, we really uh, avoid the type of attention that, that, that those issues deserve. And that's where we get to the proposed solutions that typically hinge on PNTR and the China shock. We really need to make sure that we analyze these um, on their own merits, not as often that, as, as they're often proposed, as some sort of essential correction to the mistakes of PNTR and engagement. Doing that really relieves the plans of the scrutiny they need, and it could lead to really bad governance. We've seen the China shock, for example, and PNTR used in its excuse for new protectionism and nativism, used to argue for the withdrawal of the United States from the World Trade Organization altogether, has been used by China hawks to really push for a, a more forceful and, and a hot war conflict with China. It, it also, as I noted, it, it papers over real past policy mistakes, and in doing Doing so, it really thwarts the potential for uh, a consensus for real policy solutions to real challenges, including, and of course, China. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mary. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Dr. Lovely, I will defer to you. Uh, go ahead. You, you have a, uh, a PowerPoint? Yep, I do. So first, I want to thank Scott for that uh, really wonderful overview of his paper. Um, I think the the narrative and that he uh, just provided for us shows how important the issues are that he's discussing uh, not in terms of our understanding of the past which I think is is very important uh, as a as an as an academician but because it leads us to either better or worse outcomes in the future so I think that the issues that he are, is raising are vitally important for today not for yesterday I thank him for this paper. I think it should be widely read. I'm shocked at how uh, acute, astute his reading is of the economics literature for a, a lawyer. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. Had That's to okay. It. But uh, I, I really was very impressed with your reading of the economics literature, uh, way beyond what most people do, which is they, they read some of the ADH, uh, Autor Don and Hansen literature, and then stop there. And, and clearly, that's not the end. And, I, uh, you know, ADH wouldn't want it that way either. We're, we're in the process of evolving knowledge, not having some knowledge and stopping. Okay, I am going to show some slides and hopefully uh, not take too much time. Some of this uh, material may be, um, you know, maybe something that people have more uh, questions about. Hopefully we can ha handle that in Q&A or in other things that I'm working on. Okay, so I'll go to my PowerPoint um, for our street. Here we are. <laughs> 
back to the start and I will share my screen. Are we good? Yes. Yep. Okay. So China Shock is a policy guide. Um, I want to reinforce something that Scott said very clearly. It, we are not absolving China of uh, any of its transgressions, whether they be uh, failure to meet obligations under the accession agreement that it made with the United States prior to joining the WTO, uh, whether on human rights or uh, its recent national security law in Hong Kong. Uh, what we are trying to do, I think, is actually quite patriotic. We're trying to say, as a nation, we need to have policy that's based on a clear understanding of what the external shocks and threats to the American economy are and how best we can respond to those, um, particularly thinking about the workers who are forced to adjust. You know, it's easy for people who have their job to say, well, it's only 2 million jobs. Uh, and as Scott pointed out, it's not a laughing matter, even if it is a small amount of the total jobs, it's something, it's people we care about. Oftentimes, uh, the, you know, the people who are hurt, uh, maybe those who are least able to adjust. Uh, but the United States needs to have policies that are actually effective. Uh, and where we're going now is toward, I think, uh, more trade restrictions, something that we know is ineffective. It will actually make things worse. And so that I think is, is our cause. Um, so what I'm gonna do and try to do it within the time frame is to just a little talk a little bit about why Scott's contribution is so important. Uh, and again, I urge people to read the actual policy brief. Then I'm gonna do something that's a little, a little nerdy, but I'm gonna try not to, which is I'm gonna challenge the validity of the causal claims that are in the China shock literature. Uh, I think this is important because for journalists and for outside observers, the view is, well, you know, I'm not sure about all this. Like, did, did granting permanent normal trade relationship with China really lead to the opioid outbreak or all the suicides? Um, but, oh, but these guys and the people who follow them using their methods show that it's scientifically rigorous. And I think the scientific community should have been more vigorous in looking at the scientific claims in the literature. That is a bit of a controversial uh, opinion, perhaps, uh, but I think it's one that the authors would welcome because ultimately we want to get the science right. Uh, third, I'm going to suggest some additional drivers of the U.S. labor market outcomes that I think are very important. Um, and we're going to discuss why these differences in perspectives and their implications matter for policy, basically quickly echoing what Scott said. So um, the China shock illuminated the adjustment costs of shocks. Now, you notice they don't say trade shocks. I think the China shock captured a bunch of shocks that hit the U.S. economy. Uh, over the last 30 years. And as Scott pointed out, we've had a downward trend in the percentage of employment in manufacturing uh, for quite some time. Uh, and these shocks may be due to things like changes in the training environment, but very importantly, due to changes in technology. It, the, the China shock literature did focus our attention on local areas. Uh, differences in adjustment speeds for different types of workers and their distributional consequences. Uh, we have all acknowledged that inequality is a growing and severe problem in the United States. Uh, we're looking to remedies to that. And we're, we are, I think most people were surprised at the findings on how slow labor markets are to adjust. People don't move to opportunity. Uh, we need to bring some opportunity to them is one of the conclusions that have, has come from this literature. This is important in information that we have gained. Uh, the main policy discussions have focused on net gains, as, as, as Scott pointed out. Um, but there's a, a very strong strain that has veered to what I have here, end at end trade, which means north-north trade as good and north-south trade as not good. And what that means basically is that we will stop giving a hand up to the poorest countries in the world. We will stop using our trade lever as a lever for uh, American foreign policy uh, with the view that it is negative for our economy. Um, and I think that is wrong um, and would be unfortunate. Uh, finally, as Scott mentioned, there's a very unfortunate neglect of counterfactuals and a uh, discussion of the generalizability of results. And what this means, again, is that it casts shade on uh, things like what will happen as India grows. Well, you know, if India ever decides to truly liberalize its external, it seems to be moving in the opposite direction today, but will we offer a hand up 
Uh, Vietnam, I think, would, we, we know, would, would like to have closer relations with the United States. And yet we have pulled out of the TPP of which they are a member. So these things have real consequences for real people. Uh, the China shock is very is important and worthy of your consideration because it drives popular narrative about China and more broadly about trade. I put a link here to this China shock info data because you can see at that this website, which is maintained, by, I think, by David Artur, you can link to all the numerous media reports of the China shock uh, findings. Uh, more recently, we've had a Republican example of the power of the China shock, where Ambassador Lighthizer mentioned it in the Foreign Affairs article as justification for higher tariffs uh, on China. We have a Democratic example as well from Elizabeth Warren on the campaign trail, who said that the data show that we've had a lot of problems with losing jobs and the principal reason has been bad trade policy. When this was fact-checked by the AP, they referred to, this is one of the Autor Don and Hansen papers. This one was focused on industry losses as opposed to regional losses. And they found that trade with China contributed to shuttering factories and the loss of roughly 2 million jobs. In other words, the China shock has become received wisdom. Why is the public narrative about China instead of adjustment? In other words, why have we focused our animus on China instead of thinking about how we can do a better job of making the uh, uh, American labor market more flexible and resilient? Um, it's, Auteur Don and Hansen emphasize the slow adjustment of, of labor markets and the need to target policy toward easing pain. So they themselves have pointed us, I think, in that direction. Unfortunately, the China shock literature claims point us in a different direction because they claim to have scientifically identified Chinese exports as the singular cause of this pain. If you believe that, it's simple. Stop the exports, right? So that's, that's you know, it's, it's understandable that that, despite ADH's claim of wanting free trade or freer trade, it's understandable that this is where our policymakers and the popular uh, imagination have gone. Now, their scientific strategy uh, allegedly leads them to assign specific job losses to China rather than to other drivers. Um, and this, their comparison, their particular scientific method doesn't allow for a proper counterfactual. As Scott, as Scott mentioned, there's no thought of what would happen in the, abs in the absence. So scientifically, when we think with, without, when we think about what would have happened if we hadn't granted China permanent normal trade relations, we'd want to run a scenario where the, the world evolved in a completely different fashion. As, as Scott mentioned, in that world, almost surely imports from the Pacific Rim would have maintained their total share of, of total imports. And so we would have seen imports from other countries rather than China, not a reshoring or emergence of U.S. manufacturing to replace that. Um, okay. Um, oops. You know what, can I just, let me stop sharing for one minute, and I think I have an abbreviated, um, I apologize for this, but I have an abbreviated presentation that I'd like to use, um, and hopefully I can find it. I don't want to bore you with everything that has uh, on that slide, so... Um, Okay, no, nope. Okay, um, I'm gonna try this instead. Sure. Sorry about that, folks. We always have a little technical difficulty. <laughs> okay, and where am I? Yeah, okay. So let me go here and say, is there reason to doubt the science? I was just talking, uh, to you about the science and um, same thing. Okay, so let me let me talk to you about why I think there's doubts about the science. Um, when Autor Don and Hansen were interested in showing that it was specifically China exports from China that were causing the pain. They needed to think, well, what else could be correlated with that? We don't want to ascribe, say, import demand shock in the US, uh, which would both increase manufacturing jobs and suck in more imports with this. 
And so they developed a method of doing this, which said, hey, let's look at exports to Europe and say that's what it would be uh, in the absence of any kind of you know, domestic disturbance. This has become a very popular approach to so-called identifying the China shock. And it has been used in things like uh, American uh, outcomes related to suicide, divorce, uh, you know, local uh, finance, local public finance issues, etc. Now, um, why might we think that they they didn't capture everything with these exports to uh, Europe? And my argument is very simple: exports from China were driven by a variety of factors. Scott has emphasized the domestic uh, reforms that China took, and which clearly were very powerful in driving the productivity of Chinese domestic firms. There is no question that China's domestic reforms were important. And, and Arturo and Hansen freely admit that and say, okay, that's fine, but it's still a China shock. What I want to say is that there was a larger shock going on. This was, a, we can think of it as a technology shock. 1990 to 2010, we can think of that period, was a period of tremendous fragmentation, particularly in high-tech industries. We had um, companies in the U.S. that folded. Uh, we can think or were, were really had to change their business model. You can think about uh, such familiar names to older people like myself, like Texas Instruments, or Digital Equipment Corporation, or Compaq, or even IBM, which completely shifted its business model. And what happened then was, of course, that we started getting imports from China. Oftentimes, those imports were not produced by uh, the American company investing in China. In fact, American multinationals were fairly slow to invest in China, slower than our European uh, peers. Instead, what happened is that a lot of other companies from Taiwan, Macau, uh, Singapore, Japan, invested in China and became the source of these uh, imports into the United States. So um, let me just show you, I think, a very telling table. So this is um, a table that talks about uh, the shares of Chinese exports in different years. Here we have 96, 2001, 2006, and 2013. And it shows you the type of firm that these exports are coming from. And here we have annual growth rates. So let's look at the prime China shock season here, 2001 to 2006. And I have highlighted them in yellow. The first type is um, what we call woofies. These are wholly owned foreign subsidiaries. So these are non-Chinese companies operating in China. The growth rate of their exports over this period was 34.5%. What about joint ventures, also a form of foreign invested enterprises, over 20%. What about private firms? Yes, they grew extremely fast, but look at what their share was. Their share in 2001 was only 2%. In other words, when we started this whole process, Private firms in China were virtually, virtually a non-factor in exporting. Uh, SOEs were very important, but equally important, even more important, were foreign invested enterprises. So it reminds me a little bit of, about Pogo. We have met the enemy and he is us. In other words, we are driving the China shock. And this is important because it leads us in um, several directions. Um, and let me, let me, uh, so I'll just add one more thing. Now, did this foreign investment export surge hit the countries that, that ADH use, uh, to create their scientific, I call it, it's, it's an instrumental variable known as IV, but they basically said, well, that, that's what we can use. And what we have here is enough, you're looking at the growth value of billions of U.S. dollars over time in exports into four different categories. This solid blue is exports from foreign invested firms to the U.S. And you see that tremendous growth that we've been talking about, right? Um, and, but you also see the exports from foreign invested firms to the countries that ADH say are, are, are fundamentally not experiencing the same thing as the U.S., these 
supply shocks, which I call it. And you see that that can't be true. They're following almost the same growth path. And here we have exports from private firms to both, which are following the same growth path. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen there and make a couple of final comments. I think that our focus, our, our, our tunnel vision on the China shock and as China as a source, it's all China, blinds us to this larger phenomenon that has been going on. Uh, and it blinds us to what we can do about it. First of all, we have to ask ourselves, wasn't it gainful? Uh, let me ask you, iPhones are wildly overpriced. As someone with two children, I can tell you it cost me a fortune to go to the Verizon store and replace our phones, right? You practically need to go to your bank to get a loan. Many people, in fact, do. Actually, when you pay, when you pay it off month by month, you are getting a loan. Think about who gets the money from that. And you would have to say, hmm, seems to me Apple. Yes, Apple. And the very fine jobs that have been created by Apple in the United States. Apple is a non-manufacturing firm. It doesn't show up. None of those jobs show up in the China. And more importantly, none of the profits which Apple has earned and which have flowed to many wealthy people, yes, but also many pension funds in the United States and have been largely untaxed by the United States. These are important aspects of our debate. What do we do? I was in Europe for the German Marshall Fund where a French economist said, Someone asked, well, why hasn't Europe had the same trouble with China that the US does? And he said, well, because everybody knows what happened to the United States. They lost as a result of China. Coming from a fellow economist, I found that absolutely flabbergasting. It's not on the one hand this, on the one hand that. So we see that this tunnel vision, we ignore things which are vitally important. Then ask yourself, if you're working today from Zoom or from home, how much would the technology that you are using cost if we had not, if there, were, if there was not a China. What do we do about that? How important is that to us? So we have to broaden out these questions. What jobs have been created as a result of that technology? So I think we need to really look at what Scott is saying about broadening out the discussion uh, to think about not only the variety of sources of gains, but the fact that the knee-jerk reaction, which is we should stop imports, we should raise imp import taxes, uh, it's just patently going to get us, is, is false, it's going to get us nowhere. It's not going to deliver the type of relief that workers who have suffered in the United States because of either underemployment or wages which are not really providing a living wage for them. They're going to be even more disappointed and whatever populist uh, backlash we think we've experienced, we will experience worse in the future by having policies which fundamentally fail. So um, in conclusion, I would like to say, I think this is a vital and living area of research. I thank Scott for his very informative uh, paper and for asking some very, you know, really important uh, questions about the direction of US policy uh, as we move into the election season. So thank you. Great. Um, let's, so, so if we accept the fact um, that, it made sense at the time it was, uh, you know, the relevant decisions were taken 20 years ago and not today. That, that's not to say that problems don't exist in the US-China economic relationship. Um, I'll open this to both of you. Uh, I don't, it doesn't matter who, who jumps in first, but explain sort of what the fault lines are today and, you know, sort of what the, the steps we've taken, I, I think the three of us are, are pretty much on record as, as being fairly critical of, of the Trump administration's approach to China. Um, but, but just explain generally the, the problems that exist and what might be done, what steps policymakers could have taken uh, in lieu of pursuing an aggressive unilateral trade war. And again, I, I guess, like Scott, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure. So I'll, I'll, the, the two that I noted in, in my introduction and in my paper that I, I emphasize are, um, you know, look, there, there's no doubt, particularly in the Xi Jinping uh, era, that Chinese mercantilism and Chinese uh, economic abuse, whatever you want to call it, has intensified significantly. Um, in that score, though, um, look, you know, we, we have two tools that have proven rather effective um, to help discipline that behavior. And the first is WTO dispute settlement. 
um, for all sorts of reasons, the Chinese view the WTO uh, and WTO dispute settlement as uh, as legitimate, and they are they have a decent history. Nobody's perfect of actually complying with adverse decisions. However, the United States and other countries simply have not put the pressure necessary to discipline that behavior. In fact, it's really frustrating because the argument. <clears throat> is that the WTO doesn't work, and yet we've really never utilized the WTO system. I mean, it's really uh, claiming defeat before even firing a shot. Um, and I think that there are a lot of areas, including on intellectual property and others, where not just the United States, but other WTO members in concert should really and aggressively go after uh, Chinese economic policy. Um, the other obvious area, again, is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it's not that TPP would be a magic bullet solution, but I think it really importantly provides other Asia-PAC members with an alternative. And the alternative is the U.S. market and the gravity that it has. You know, it is, it is frankly absurd that the president talks about um, trying to ship supply chains out of China, including even tweeting about them going to Vietnam. And yet here we had an agreement in the TPP that would have really facilitated that, would have encouraged that type of investment, would have encouraged imports from those countries. Um, you know, it, you go to places like Korea, for example, and you really see the influence of China. Um, you know, this is the, the, the Chinese orbit the gravity of the Chinese economy is so substantial that really anything we can do to to have a little pull opposite um, it would be would be immensely important. So that's where I, I would start on the on the um, economic side. The only other thing I'd add is that look the human pro the human rights issues here are are tremendous and the there are serious serious problems. Um, but we also, again, have to ask what works and what doesn't. And unilateral sanctions generally don't work very well, particularly this kind of ham-handed tariff everything approach that really undermines uh, the efficacy uh, and the kind of um, the message uh, when you actually do need to drop the hammer and do something like targeted financial sanctions. Um, a multilateral approach there is far better. It's proven to be far more effective and it is less likely to embolden uh, nationalists in China, state-owned enterprises in China and the rest, which unfortunately is what a lot of Trump tariff policy has done. Dr. Lovely. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually agree with everything Scott says. Um, people might think we agree on everything. It's far from the far from the case, but in this case, I I endorse it. Um, I think that in regard to the WTO, um, you know, many of the claims that were made in the 301 report regarding uh, technology uh, uh, transfer, forced technology transfer, yeah. I theft, uh, would be violations of China's accession agreement and could have been brought through the WTO. Again, even at the time that uh, the initial uh, 301 suit was brought, other countries were saying the same thing. So Japan, uh, it's multinationals, uh, Korea, uh, the European Union. So we had a natural you know, gang uh, who would have supported us. Instead, we decide to do something which is very alienating and, and frankly in violation of the WTO. So uh, it was defeating when we really snatched, you know, defeat from the jaws of success there, I think. Uh, and we have seen over and over again that the tariffs are not winning for the United States. Uh, we have now very serious academic studies which look at the prices that we're paying for our goods and we are not seeing the tariffs being eaten by Chinese producers. They're being passed forward to U.S. companies and to U.S. consumers. Two thirds of the things we import from China are inputs into what we manufacture. So we're actually reducing our competitiveness in manufacturing with this. So that's what I mean by shooting ourselves in the foot. So we could have gone through the accession agreement. I think we would have had more success. Um, just to add one thing to Scott uh, saying that we know the mercantilist uh, behavior has increased. I would just take a step back and say we need to, we need again to take a more nuanced approach. Where have it, has it Let's be more specific. They have also made important reforms in opening up. And this is what they constantly say to us. And we roll our eyes and say, oh, this is what you always say. 
But instead of saying, okay, here's some areas where you have opened up just this past month, they've opened up to wealth management products. Uh, they are removing ownership controls for um, uh, the manufacture of regular, you know, ordinary combustion engine uh, uh, automobiles. Uh, you saw them open up on electric vehicles for Elon Musk. So there's, there's lots of other areas, uh, less, you know, top line uh, where China has opened up. So what is it that they're doing? Unless we really know that, we can't have that, no, we want you to change this. And that is what we need. And we have, in fact, it's sort of retarded the U.S. government's ability to engage in that by, yes, having fewer people on the ground, having fewer reporters there, uh, and having uh, just fewer experts who are able to tell us uh, where to go. And that's going to hurt our negotiations uh, and our ability. Uh, Barry Nor Norton, uh, a very well-known observer of the Chinese economy and the author of two very uh, uh, popular textbooks on the Chinese economy, recently called China a strategic opportunist before the U.S.-China Security Economic Commission. And I think that is an excellent way to put it. Think about the chessboard. Where, what are, where, you know, what's the space that we are creating uh, for them to operate within? Uh, and the space that we have been creating for them is very, very broad. Uh, and I, I would leave one, you know, just one statistic to prove that. Just after two years of the Trump trade war, China's share of world exports and manufacturing has not changed a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So by just thinking about this as a two country world, we have ignored the fact yeah. that it's not. Right. It the, uh, thanks, and I, I agree with everything Mary said as well. Um, but I, I think I'd add uh, uh, one other policy, uh, and, and that's immigration. Um, you know, there is a tremendous opportunity for the United States to welcome refugees uh, and high skill immigrants as well. Um, there was a great new paper that came out about a week ago showing that past restrictions, past U.S. restrictions on high-skilled immigrants through the H-1B visa program actually bolstered China's economic competitiveness, um, which is just incredible because when you look at areas like semiconductors, where apparently China is this great industrial threat, um, this is precisely the areas where China is most weak, human capital. So there is a tremendous strategic opportunity. I mean, leaving aside the moral issues and all that, there's a tremendous strategic opportunity here for the United States to... Uh, to have a, a leg up, so to say, um, by really dramatically expanding uh, high skill immigration and then again, refugees, whether it's Hong Kong or the Uyghurs, the rest. I think that's right. Um, I, I would add on to this, I'll use some moderator's prerogative here, that I, I think that there needs to be some humility among policy analysts and policy makers in the United States because the idea that there's any one sort of silver bullet that the United States can uh, use to, to radically overhaul yeah. the Chinese economy, I think, is, is ridiculous. Um, but, but to be fair, I think that both Dr. Lovely and Scott have hit on important things that the United States can do sort of on the margins, right? Um, and so we, it's important to kind of um, define expectations downward. Um, you know, we would all love to see dramatic changes, I think, to the, to the Chinese economy, especially in, in certain areas, industrial subsidies being a, a primary uh, example. Um, but, but again, it, it's, this will not happen without buy-in from the Chinese. They have to want to make these decisions or make these changes. Um, and, you know, I, I just don't, I, sort of getting to, to Scott's point, I don't know that... Um, our ultra hawkish rhetoric and, and some of these other issues that sort of bubble up around around this uh, relationship do much to, to help uh, that that cause. Um, that's not to say that the United States should sit by idle and, and sort of let this happen. I, I think there are serious and real challenges. But I, I get back to the overall um, one of my frustrations with this conversation that, that instead of thinking about this stuff going forward. How do we adapt to where we are today? We spend way too much time litigating 20 years ago, and, and people have latched on as, as both 
uh, the guests have, have discussed um, in ways that I, I think are, are really detrimental. It, it doesn't sort of move this conversation forward. Um, but, but, you know, it, it's, it's weird, right? You, you listen to, to members of Congress um, and pundits, and there's just this massive consensus right now that, that we are on the verge of a Cold War with China and the United States needs to be actively um, sort of antagonizing China rather than trying to figure out ways to work with the Chinese on certain issues, acknowledge that there are going to be certain areas where you're not going to agree, um, but, but where can you agree and what can, we, what can be done to sort of move the ball forward? Uh, those are my sort of closing thoughts. I will see if there are any questions. Um, and I, I don't see any. Um, I will give this just a minute, uh, see if there are any further questions. All right. Um, hearing or seeing none, I guess. Oh. Hold on, one's coming. <laughs> Riley Walters from the Heritage Foundation is typing out a question. Must be a long question. <laughs> China Shock is now five years old, but still popular. What, what's the simple, quote, counter narrative? Um, and then Riley said, I'm sorry, I'm a slow typer. <laughs> <laughs> so so again, not, the, the China that. Shock is five years old, but still popular. What's a simple counter narrative to that? Sure. Well, I think the most, the simplest counter narrative is simply to ask the counterfactual as what would have happened in the absence of China, Chinese imports. Let's say you could just throw up a wall, forget uh, all the little customs tricks I just mentioned. You can throw up a wall and Chinese imports are out. What would have, would have happened? And I think that is, um, that is the, the what we know or what we, we see in the data and what we know from experience is that blocking Chinese imports would not have prevented the, the shock that we saw, that, that it is not simply a matter of Chinese imports. These are actually far more kind of uh, far bigger and more seismic issues dealing with labor markets and cultural issues and communities and the re and industries, evolution of industries. Um, and it's that question you need to ask. And there it's, I think, a pretty, pretty straightforward answer that, that it was, it, um, we still would have had uh, the shock, um, just uh, maybe, maybe a little slower, but it still would have happened. Dr. Lovely. Yeah, I agree. I tried to offer uh, an alternative narrative based on basically technological change that led to deeper integration between the two economies, of which we were fully a participant. Uh, so, and we gained from it in multiple ways. So there were losers and there are gainers, as we often say. Uh, and we start thinking about how do we take those gains and distribute them more equitably. So, you know, I think that's really the challenge. And then you say, well, why aren't people grabbing onto that? That's really hard. We have not figured out uh, how to tax tech profits. We're going to have the tech, you know, giants uh, testifying before Congress this week. So we'll see, we'll see some squirming, but you know, probably not much action. Uh, and I don't have the answer to that. I think it's a difficult answer. Taxi mobile capital is a difficult answer. Um, so, you know, and it, it's so much easier just to blame somebody else. I mean, I hate to say it, but it just is. It's easier. Yeah. And the Chinese make it very easy because yeah. they're doing hateful things, okay? Yeah. The problem with that is that it's not going to lead to good outcomes for Americans. So if you care about Americans, you care about us getting this right. I can't stress that enough because a lot of times people come back and say, oh, you know, you're just being an apologist for China. That's not what it's about. We're Americans first. We want to get this right. We want the next decade to be yeah. a better place for American workers. All right. I, I I, I just would piggyback one quick thing. And I think the other really important thing about the current policies is that there's also a lot of evidence, mounting evidence, that they've actually been counterproductive. It's not even about, it, so, so doing something, you don't get points for doing something when what you've done is actually making things worse. And I think that's also a really critical point. I, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, one last question here. Um, 
if everybody has time. The, the question is, do you think a Biden administration would have a better trade policy with respect to China, specifically rejoining the TPP, working through the WTO? Um, sort of project out how you think a Biden administration, a would-be Biden administration, would deal with the issue of China as opposed to, to sort of the, the Trump administration, ultra yeah. hawkish uh, tariff war. Um, explain your, your sort of thoughts on that. On that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they can be any worse. Um, you know, because look, the, the fact that the mere fact that we might, we're probably the United States under a Biden administration would probably not be openly attacking our, our allies, the EU, Japan and the rest, um, and doing all sorts of um, disruptive and problematic, aggressive things towards, towards natural allies, as Mary mentioned, and not just developed countries, in developing, developing countries too. So just that sheer fact alone would be an improvement. Um, and I think, as I mentioned, on immigration and a few other areas, I think they would, they would be helpful, um, good and helpful there. That said, I don't think we really know just how uh, liberal, uh, in, the, in the little L classic sense, um, the Biden administration will be on trade policy. The, there is a, the fact is that the Democratic Party uh, has an identity crisis on trade um, with you know, a, a younger electorate, generally trade supportive, a bunch of folks that are just anti whatever Trump is doing, so who knows where they really stand. And then of course, kind of an old school um, union backed uh, group that that is is very trade skeptical. And then of course, they're kind of the, the new progressive socialist, whatever you want to call them, also trade skeptical. So that tension, you can actually see it in the Biden campaign materials. Um, and so it's really difficult to say whether they actually would rejoin TPP, um, whether they actually would eliminate a lot of the tariffs in place that are on our allies, um, and, and, and whether they would be better at, at even at the WTO. Um, I think maybe a little bit on maybe appellate body judges, but beyond that, you know, I don't think it's clear. And so look, we'll, we'll take, I think given the, the situation of, of U.S. trade policy right at the moment. Yes, it's going to be a step up, but but it might be a small one. Dr. Lovely. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, you do see this tension in their campaign materials. I think that the politics are such, there's so much sort of poison in the water right now that despite the fact that the China tariffs are self-defeating, uh, you will not see Biden uh, rolling them back anytime soon. Uh, but the fact that he would start to work with his with the allies is vitally important. I think that this continual rhetoric about a cold war is 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 supremely unhelpful, because um, well, first of all, we know it's it's it you know it's it's gonna it's not gonna lead anywhere good, uh, and secondly. We don't have allies with us. Just over the past few weeks, the European Union, Japan, and Australia have all signaled that they have problems with China, but they're not backing up behind the US to isolate China. So it's going to be the Cold War is going to be US against the world. It's not really the Cold War. The question we should be asking is are we going to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world? Asking the American public that question is very different than, hey, do you think China is bad because of what's happened in Xinjiang? That's what's going on right now. So yeah. I think changing that rhetoric can be very important. I think leadership is important in terms of how we view China. Uh, Pew polls have shown an extraordinary increase in support for trade. Uh, surprisingly, you would think during this period of hot trade wars, it would absolutely be going in a different direction, and it isn't. So I think leadership matters. Uh, I think the American public is ready for a new approach, and I guess we'll see you in November. Great. Um, do we have time? Do you both have time for one last question? Sure. Okay, great. Um, question is, is there a way to draw a, a clear line between Chinese policies and practices that pose a legitimate national security risk to the United States and those that don't? In other words, by, de by identifying national security risks, we may be in a better position to maintain beneficial economic relations in, in other areas. Um, I'll go first to give Scott the last word because this is sure. his party. But, um, you know, I think that it's important for national security you know, experts and, and economists to have a dialogue and maybe even lawyers because I'm, I'm finding that they have value. Um, 
you know, but uh, that's a hard thing. It, it's not something that is done easily. Uh, so that we are cognizant of the economic costs. You know, national security types will say, well, better safe than sorry, let's close it off. Right. Even though we know that a lot of times these routes are easily, you know, arbitraged around. So I think that it's important that we have that discussion, but we, as we've seen time and time again, drawing these, you know, lines very clearly as the, the, the person who asked the question might ask, it's just impossible. It's gonna be trial and error. We're gonna to have to work with our allies. We're gonna to have to, you know, reignite our cooperation on intelligence uh, and export controls. Uh, and right now, I think our allies are not on board with that in a way that they need to be. So sure. I'll leave the last word to Scott. Thanks. And so I, um, I agree with that. I think that, look, I think there is a way to establish some pretty clear metrics to define what is not a national security threat. And I think that's the starting point. Because look, the, the term national security, as we've seen over the last few years, can be horribly abused. The WTO has a very open-ended and discretionary exception for national security, which of course the Trump administration has also abused. Um, so it is, it is an area that of course has merit. Um, you know, even uh, Milton Friedman has said there's a national security exception to free trade. But at the same time, you know, in practical terms, it is an area ripe for abuse. That said, look, I think there are things that the United States in terms of national security could do to simply um, have an objective decision about, well, that's actually not a national security threat, regardless of the product. And, and that should start with things like examining, well, what is domestic, actual domestic production in the United States? You know, you look at steel, for example, we had national security tariffs put in place when we were still producing 70%, uh, US steel industry had 70% market share, crazy, crazy stuff, right? So you start at US production and market share, look at global production and market share, China's share of that. Um, and then once you establish kind of those objective metrics, then I think you've narrowed down the field dramatically. Um, you know, semiconductors is another area you hear about. I already, you know, it's, it's, uh, they're already throwing out national security subsidies um, for, for uh, because of Chinese semiconductors. And again, when you actually look at what's going on, there's not nearly the threat that it's imagined. So, so actually, mine would be kind of a negative list approach. I think we can establish what isn't a national security threat. And then as Mary mentioned, have the, the national defense uh, folks, the folks at the Pentagon, uh, uh, economists, and maybe even a lawyer, yes, maybe even a lawyer, uh, get in in the mix and, and, and uh, hammer it all out. Great. Thank you all so much for your time. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Uh, these are important questions. Uh, we will keep this dialogue going. Um, please look out for various research from Cato, the Peterson Institute, and R Street. With that, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon to y'all.